Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. So when we look at basically tooth-supported overdentures, it's a similar idea to when we'll think about implant-supported overdentures, only it's over natural teeth. Now, a lot of the concepts and things you see us come up with with tooth-supported overdentures came about during the times when we did not have implants as an option. Okay? So, gee, why didn't you do an implant-supported overdenture? Well, at the time a lot of these concepts came out, that wasn't on the list because we didn't have them. So, again, looking at overall treatment, I mean, this is all totally review to you people, where you get your data collection and diagnosis, you do the systemic phase where you're sure that what's going on with the patient systemically? Do they have any medical conditions or are they on any drugs that would have a dental impact? And the most common dental impact from various drugs taken is what? Dry mouth, okay, lack of saliva. And if you're doing dentures, that may have an impact on dentures because amount of spit and type of spit can be a big factor in how well a denture is retained in the mouth. Okay, we do our disease control phase. So fillings, bad teeth come out, necessary root canals done, whatever. And along with disease control phase, you do your preparatory phase and reassessment. Now, historically, I would say, and I, I run this by people a lot, in my own practicing life, some of the biggest divots on my face, okay, some of the biggest scars on my face and on my heart, are when I was real anxious to get launched into corrective phase when I had never really gotten control of the dental caries for the patient or periodontal disease because now I get my nice fancy Rolex watch made here this real precise precision attachment partial blah blah crown and bridge blah blah everything's looking really nice and I'm feeling like a really tall dog in short grass I'm feeling really pretty good about myself and then I look at this thing come back four years later, and there's recurrent caries on the margin of about three-quarters of the crowns. And then the patient's going, gee, doctor, how come this is all happening? Well, it's happening because back here, and with the reassessment, we never really had control of the sugar in the patient's diet. Yes, their hygiene, but also the sugar. So if there's anything I can stress on people, if you're going to be in practice a lot of years in the same location, if you don't do a good job on this and you launch ahead to this, it will come back and bite you in the ass. Because mine's been bitten on lots. And so all I'm saying is learn from the stuff I didn't do enough of the first 15 or so years of my practicing life. So now I'm a lot more of a hard guy about this and the reassessment. And if it seems like we're not making progress on plaque control and or sugar in the diet we may stay with sort of some sort of temporary flipper or some aesthetic replacements and some direct placement restorative materials and not necessarily launch immediately into extensive crown and bridge because it comes back to bite us. And then obviously we go into maintenance and outcome phase assessment. So here's a picture, if you can, it's out of an old textbook. So what we used to see is the most common tooth that was saved if we were going to do a lower overdenture typically was the cuspid teeth had the longest roots, even when there was a fair amount of caries in the mouth, if one were to do endodontics on the two cuspids, and then here they're just filled up with temporary, you know, cavit, temporary stopping material, you'd go ahead and make what would look pretty much like a normal lower denture, and over the top of these we would typically put either amalgams or glass ionomer fillings in the endo access opening and just let the denture rest on the roots of the teeth. And this is one of those things that often comes up on your midterm or your final exam. Is what is the main reason for saving tooth roots, for retaining tooth roots in an overdenture? And the main reason is to preserve alveolar bone. Many people will say the main reason is to put some sort of a retentive device into the tooth roots to help retain the denture to help keep it in, and that is a help if we've determined that the patient can keep the plaque off these teeth and not lose them. But the primary reason for saving teeth is to preserve bone. 
And so when the patient bites down, especially in the mandibular arch, there's something down there. So when they bite down firmly, that not all that pressure goes just on the lower gums. Because I hope we're all clear by this time that of the upper and lower arches in a complete denture, it's the lower arch that is at a mechanical disadvantage and a physiologic disadvantage. Everybody clear on that? <clears throat> How come? Any thoughts? There's less of it. Look at a maxillary denture and calculate roughly how many square inches of gums you have to rest to spread the load of the bite force out on. Okay? Look at a lower denture. It's this little horseshoe. It's a little rainbow. And of that horseshoe that you see, the lateral throat form, those lingual flanges may help stabilize the denture, but they don't do a darn thing for supporting the load of the bite. So the load, the pressure, when you bite down on a lower denture, is borne by the areas by the retromolar pad and the buccal shelf. The very crest of the ridge gives some support, but your primary support areas are retromolar pad, buccal shelf, and to a secondary degree, the crest of the ridge. And the lingual flanges on a lower denture may help stabilize the denture, but they're not going to do a whole lot to give it vertical support. And so when you look at arches in a complete denture case, the lower arch is always at the disadvantage because there's less of it. Okay? In the maxillary arch, you've got the crest of the ridge, but you've got that entire hard palate, that whole roof of the mouth area to help support the bite. So if you're going to see resorption, differential resorption, upper and lower arch, which arch do you suppose resorbs more? The bottom. And so anything we can do to help preserve bone in the lower arch, long term is an advantage. So like I say, historically we would wind up saving the cuspids. So what are we doing is if you look at cross sections of arches, and you've seen this picture before in some other lectures I'll do, Basically, on two implant-supported overdentures, okay, Atwood et al. did basically some studies that they took things. It was a review article, and they did took uh, literature from Angie Tallgren and other people. But what do you look at? You basically look at if you got a grade one mandible, okay, it's fairly tall. It's got a nicely rounded ridge. Okay, what's that, about 11% of the people? So let's go to a grade two. A lot of times on a grade two, and this comes true also if you're thinking we went two implant lower overdenture. With some ridges, when you look at the panorex, the ridge will seem fairly tall. So you look at the panorex, and the ridge looks pretty tall top to bottom. But the other thing you want to make sure you do is look inside the mouth and take your fingers and pinch the ridge in the anterior region to see how thick is it labiolingually. Because a lot of times if it's tall but it's not very wide, not much help. So the type 1 ridge may be tall, but it's also fairly broad. The type 2 ridge may be tall, but it's not so broad at the top. It's got a knife edge ridge. And then we go basically with the grade 3. Okay, maybe that one's more resorbed, somewhat well-rounded, and then your type 4 is pretty severely resorbed. So the whole idea is if we've got a couple teeth here over time, we may be able to preserve some of this lower ridge better than we can here. Now, the thing in your practicing life when you're faced with this ridge, you have a very nice option now in that you have the option of the two implant lower overdenture. The thing that's going to get reviewed when I go over two implant lower overdenture at the end of this course is on these two images. Again, when we had teeth to work with, the most common teeth that were saved for lower overdentures were mandibular cuspids, canines. When it comes to if we're considering doing a two-implant lower overdenture, and that's not the subject of today's lecture, but if one's thinking two-implant lower overdenture, when we first started doing them years ago, where do you suppose the most common place that we put the implants was? In the same area where the canines used to be, because that's what we'd always done with teeth. So we just sort of stuck them where the teeth were. Now, a lot of times we've changed our philosophy on that nowadays, and what we tend to do now is to go ahead and put the implants in the areas where the lateral incisors would be. So in this ridge, if we mark the midline, and once we got the midline, if we measured over 7 to 8 millimeters and put one implant here, 
go back to the midline and measure over 7 to 8 millimeters and put another implant here. So those two implants are spaced as though we were planning for five implants. But we only place two. Because if you put the implants typically in the areas where the cuspids were, not that it will all the time, but let's say once in a great while the patient says, this has worked out so well, doc. Could we put in some more implants? And could I go with some sort of a fix to permanently screwed in lower appliance? And to do that, most authors agree that you need five to six implants evenly spaced between the metal foramina. So what would happen is, if when you first placed implants, if you said, let's go more or less in the cuspid area. During surgery, the surgeon's going to be hedge their bets just a little bit and bring things just a little bit more forward to make sure they don't bump into the mental foramen and get too close to the nerve. When they then get their two implants in, typically there's room for two ideally spaced between them, but not necessarily three. This is if you're thinking all implants. The other thing is, and when we had the teeth, we didn't have a lot of choice. Can you see when you've got these two teeth, if the denture rests on those, draw a straight line across those two teeth, and you see there's a little bit of the ridge that arcs out forward of this. And so when the denture's in place and the patient bites on the incisor teeth, there's going to be a little bit of an anterior tilt in this front region because it curves out in front of the lower teeth. Now, if it's a two-implant lower overdenture, we don't have any choice. This beats nothing. But if we're doing an implant retained overdenture rather than an overdenture on teeth, and the teeth are just where they are, if I was doing it with implants and I put the two implants nearer the front, then what happens is I pretty much eliminate that anterior tilting that might exist when the patient bites down. So for natural teeth, Lower arch, most commonly saved teeth are cuspids. Most commonly saved teeth are cuspids. They've got a long root. They're usually the best candidate of what's left when we're doing these. If we're planning an implant overdenture from scratch, we would tend to mark the midline and move over 7 to 8 millimeters each side of the midline and have the implants more or less in the area of the lateral incisors. But when we first started doing implant-supported overdentures. We first started putting them more or less where the cuspids used to be. So that's the difference between tooth-supported overdentures and implant. So here's basically, you know, implants with ball anchors on them. Again, I would have tended to move these just a little bit closer to the midline. Niels Brill is a guy that wrote back in 1955 about overdentures, but one of our former faculty who's passed away went in, I guess they're going to be closing the library in the foreseeable future, but a pretty neat thing if you go in the dental library is you go up to the second floor, up to the mezzanine, and in the stacks up on the second floor are all sorts of books. The primary two books that the journals that were published a lot of, one was called Dental Cosmos, and the other one was called Dental Items of Interest. And tons of those stacks up on the mezzanine are dental literature from about 1850 to 1890. So you can go back and you can read the 1855 articles when they were talking about doing overdentures in the 1860s. So there's nothing new in dentistry, okay? Nothing new in dentistry. When we sort of talk about classification of overdentures, we think of them as either immediate overdentures, a transitional overdenture, or a remote. And all we mean by a remote overdenture is the same thing as we would call a definitive appliance the final appliance that is made sometime distant or remote from that time when the teeth were extracted, except for the teeth that would be used for the overdenture. Why do we want to hang on to them? Okay, they're going to support and stabilize the denture. They're going to preserve the ridge, especially in the lower arch. They're going to increase the patient's ability to bite down hard because they've got some teeth to help support the denture. Again, this is particularly true in the lower arch. Because you still have a periodontal ligament around teeth, even more so than an implant, you've got proprioception. And there are studies that would indicate that people have a more rhythmic or a more coordinated chewing cycle if they've got the proprioception from the teeth. With retention, as I say, that's a secondary gain from the teeth. The primary, primary reason is to preserve the ridge. That's the primary reason is preserve this ridge. 
Retention is one of the advantages, and if I were going to do retention, I would add it later on when the patient has proven to me that they can keep the plaque off the teeth. And many times patients are psychologically aided or helped by the fact that they still have some of their own teeth left. So sometimes they're called overlay dentures. Europeans sometimes will call them a hybrid prosthesis. The telescoping denture, there are some cases in the early days when they were making these in which they did not endodontically treat the teeth that were being retained. They'd prep the teeth sort of for a full crown and put a really thin gold thimble on it, leaving it standing up tall in the air and build a denture over the top of this thimble. So imagine preparing a tooth as much as you can so it's sort of prepared low and you've teepeed it in a bit and then you make a real thin gold thimble and then fit the denture over that. Anybody see what might be one of the possible disadvantages to doing, a de doing an overdenture like that? People would say the advantage is you don't have the patient pay for the root canal treatment. And that's true. Anybody think of any disadvantages to that? Can you see that if the denture is fitting over this telescopic crown when they bite on the denture, it puts a lot of levering force on that crown? So periodontally, you're going to put a lot of stress on that tooth. So those teeth many times were rocked out or were put, a lot of stress was put on those teeth because they weren't cut off level with the gum line. So it saved the endo, but you had to put some sort of a gold coping on them because you'd prepped them way down. Um, and so for me, the telescoping dentures, I'm not all that much in support of. They call them tooth-supported dentures or overdentures. Physiologic basis, what do we got? Sensory input, alveolar bone, increase in occlusal forces, improved masticatory performance, maybe partly because you can chew harder, maybe partly because you've got the proprioception. And the tooth mobility, if you had teeth that you were considering saving for the overdenture that were somewhat mobile by the time you endodontically treat them and cut them off nearly even with the gum line, can you see you've taken the lever arm away pretty much? So the root to crown ratio just got drastically improved because you took most of the crown away. All you got left is root and the couple millimeters that sticks above the bone. So your root to crown ratio on an overdenture gets really good. So many times if you see a patient like this, that's somebody, and it used to be for several years we just didn't see patients like this. So the thought that you'd have a patient that would present like this was like, well, you guys are never going to see that because with fluoride and other things, we've pretty much gotten rid of this kind of caries. And then... Uh, some genius comes up with Mountain Dew and a few other things that people seem to be addicted to sipping pop 24-7 or sucking Tic Tacs 24-7. And so in the last few years, I'm seeing more patients walk in with this kind of caries that I wouldn't have believed 15 years ago. So you really do see some of these patients that are, that are pretty much dental nightmares and moving ahead with some sort of definitive crown and bridge on this patient is not really the best option for the patient. What we want to get always is a real good set of study models or if we're going to make the dentures on these casts, really, really good casts. If you're taking alginate impressions to do an immediate denture or an immediate stay plate, the temporary denture, which we'll call an immediate stay plate, areas that you really need to get really well are these tuberosity areas. Get great depth of vestibule up here in the anterior area. Get good depth of vestibule back in these tuberosity areas of the upper. Same on the other side. Good extension into these vestibular areas. On the lower, good vestibular extension and capture the retromolar pad. So we've got all the way back to and including the retromolar pad. Again, those are your landmarks. On the handouts you got the very first day of class, you've got those pictures of edentulous ridges and pictures of casts of edentulous ridges, and it points out the anatomical landmarks. So whether there's teeth there or not, you can look for those landmarks because you want to see them on any case you're doing. Even for crown and bridge, many times people are doing crown and bridge, there's severe breakdown on some of the lower teeth, or the teeth have broken down and they have extruded, bringing the alveolus up with them. So you get a good set of mounted study models and go back and look at your landmarks. Look at the center of the retromolar pad and then come forward from the center of the retromolar pad and say, where, do my lower, where does my lower plane of occlusion line up with that 
imaginary plane of reference. So just because we use these landmarks for dentures doesn't mean that they're not equally applicable in Crown and Bridge, especially when you're doing larger cases. What happens when you lose all the teeth if you've got a dentate individual here and you say, okay, we're going to take out all of the teeth? Well, by some definitions, depending on who you read, the alveolar process of the teeth, this area of alveolus, is the investing osseous structure that surrounds the roots of the teeth. So the alveolar process is where the roots of the teeth fit into the bone, and it's where the periodontal ligaments that attach to the roots of the teeth go and attach to the bone. Now, some people will say that once you lose the teeth, so the roots of the teeth are no longer there, there's no reason for the alveolar process to be there. So we've got a tooth, we've got PDL and all this other stuff. We take the tooth out, we've just got a denture sitting over this, just putting pressure on this area. So many people would say, well, golly, there's no longer a tooth root in here. What's the reason for that to even be there? So over time, we may see the alveolar process continue to resorb until it gets down in situations like this. If you look up here and take a landmark such as the mental foramen. So here's a mental foramen. We start to get some alveolar process residual ridge reduction. And we see the mental foramen creep up closer to the top. We see the mental foramen up, creep up closer to the top, closer to the top. Mental foramen is sitting up on top of the ridge. Did the location of the mental foramen change? No. The entire ridge came down. And so when you treat some patients that have fairly resorbed ridges and they say, gee, doctor, it seems like when I use my lower dentures, once in a while I'll get a sharp electric shock or my lip goes numb. What do you suppose one of the causes of that is? It's that basically where their inferior alveolar nerve is sitting right here on the top of the ridge, the denture presses down on it. You take a gloved finger, you can feel right over that, you can palpate it, and as you rub your finger from buccal to lingual, you'll feel the nerve just jump back and forth under your hand. And they'll sort of go, uh, because they get like a little sensation or a shock from that. So if that's a situation, it's sort of like that's what we're trying to avoid with either retaining teeth or placing implants to give dentures some support. Okay? We talked about physiologic input. Root to crown ratio. Okay, we say, gee, if we've had some loss of periodontal support, maybe we don't have such a great root to crown ratio, but endotonically treat it, cut it off just barely at the gum line, and suddenly the root to crown ratio is drastically improved for the teeth. Now, many times, secondarily, when the patient's proven they can keep the teeth reasonably clean, we may come along and put a post and coping on the tooth, a post and gold coping with some sort of retentive mechanism on the root of the tooth. And then the other half of the retentive mechanism is in the denture. So at this point, we're getting both some support for the denture and some retention from the retained teeth. But again, our primary purpose is to preserve bone. We say psychological advantage. Basically, patients can say, I still have some of my own teeth. What very often happens to these patients is they were never the stars of the oral hygiene class to start with, or they wouldn't need dentures in the first place. But with some number of these patients, we save some teeth, cut them off at the gum line, make them a transitional set of dentures, and over the next one to three years, through lack of care on their own part, we lose the retained teeth. We keep getting recurrent decay at the root faces, and either we try to do a gingivoplasty or periodontal surgery to cut the gums and the bone down, clean the top of the tooth off again, put a glass of animal filling in, they come back six months later, and it's decayed again. At some point, you go ahead and just take the teeth out. But what you may say is that those retained teeth have acted a little bit like training wheels to let the patient get adapted to the denture a little better. So sometimes even if the teeth are lost over a couple or three years, this is especially in the lower denture, they've acted as a set of training wheels for the patient, adapting them to the dentures. What do we get sometimes if we have a less than favorable outcome? Because many times when, you, when you're treating denture patients, if you're treating a patient for complete dentures, I'll often ask students, and you need to be thinking about this when you're treatment planning the denture patient. How do you know when you're done? 
I'll say it again because it seems too simple on the surface. If you're treating a denture patient, when are you completed with the denture? Now, you can all say the day you deliver the denture, but you're all realistic enough to know that in the real world of private practice, what happens after you deliver the denture? What do you then start? The adjustment phase for the denture? So let's say the patient comes back for two or three appointments and there's specific sore spots. So you can see red spots or they're biting their cheek or you see some real definitive things that you adjust and the patient says that's better. Now for 15 to 20% of your patients, assuming you do very many dentures, you may or may not, and this can also hold true with partial dentures or crown and bridge, for 15 to 20% of your patients, they don't ever want to get better. Because you are a social outlet, they feel unloved and unappreciated in other corners of their life, and you seem to fawn over them when they come into your office. And so why would anybody want to jettison that portion of their life? Especially if they're a shut-in, the kids don't come to visit, or whatever else. So now we're at posterior, or post-insertion adjustment 23. Post-insertion adjustment number 23. Hi, Mrs. McGillicuddy. Gee, we just saw you last week. What is it this week? And then Mrs. McGillic... So the question then again becomes, when are you finished with the denture? How do you know when you're done? So you need to develop some strategies for Mrs. McGillicuddy so that when she comes back, gee, ma'am, we've done everything we can. And this gets you thinking back to when you first did your intake exam. One of the questions that you can ask in an innocent way, gee, Mrs. McGillicuddy, how many dentures have you had in the last 15 years? And sometimes they'll even bring in the bag. This was wrong with this one, and this was wrong with this one, and this is wrong with this one, and this is wrong with this one, but you remind me of my grandson or my granddaughter, and you seem really sincere, I can tell by looking in your eyes, and so I really know that you're going to do better than these other slimy bastards did, because you're something special about you. And because we all have egos, you just suck that stuff up like, uh, you're just, uh, you're just right there, okay? And then now that you're at adjustment, post-insertion adjustment 23, what's, where is the discussion going now? So remember some of those kinds of things that we have some strategies. Going way back to the beginning, did the patient have unrealistic expectations and did you address them hard and fast right away? Did you communicate really clearly with your patient? And sometimes in the days of computers, if necessary, whether it's dentures or not, do you have some boilerplate printable, outable thing that when you're talking about some treatment, whether it's a root canal or bridges, that discuss what some of the things are that can go wrong with the root canal or can go wrong with the bridge, even if you do everything right. And a huge part of any corrective phase stresses the fact that their diet and their home care has a huge amount of their risk for caries. So you can write that in the record, but there can also be some blurb that you just print out that since we're considering having bridges done or doing root canals, here's a rat fact sheet that you should know. And many times component societies, the American Society of Endodontists, puts out blurbs like that. And the American Society of Prostodontists puts out blurbs like that. You can come up with your own, but have some sort of informed consent that goes with the patient. So did you communicate with the patient? Did you have failures in patient compliance? And that's one thing you want to document if the patient doesn't comply. Do you have, when it comes to an overdenture, do you have a tooth that has either an endo or a perio failure? And that's one of the things that can be discussed in a boilerplate printout thing that you hand to the patient. Okay. Abutments that you chose to use, were they compromised? And did you make it clear to the patient that this is just, we hope, a set of training wheels to get you from here to there? The big one, misunderstanding relative to fees. When it comes to immediate placement dentures, or as we say, stay plates, temporary dentures, what do you suppose the biggest thing that the patient claims they never heard was? That we will charge you for the reline that we know we are all going to have to do in four to six months. We know your gums are going to change. We know the dentures are going to fit like socks on a rooster some short amount of time down the road. And when that happens, we're going to need to reline them. And when we reline them, we're going to have to charge you. 
And I can't tell you the number of times, either here at school or in private practice, people would come and say, gee, I never understood that I had to pay for the relay. And I thought, sort of like when I buy my car, I thought I got oil changes forever. And tires. And wiper fluid and the rest of it. It's sort of like, no, it doesn't work that way. So try really hard to not have misunderstandings relative to fees. So when you're talking to patients, a lot of the times you think, gee, when we talk about these Venn diagrams, you've got your idea of what they need and the patient's got their idea of what they need. And in your mind, you think those two circles perfectly superimpose, that you're all on the same page. A surprising amount of time, the two circles don't even touch. So try to be as sure as you can that you don't have that situation. So what do you have in patients that basically things just didn't go well? One of them was you probably didn't listen to your intuition. Your tummy was talking to you. Your tummy said, something feels queer about this. And, you, and your brain got in there and said, yeah, but the money. I really want that new set of, or I really want those new stereo speakers, or I really want the down payment on that lot on the lake, or whatever. And this isn't just about dentures. This can be about anything. So if there's some things coming up, Look for the warning signs. Okay, don't ignore them. Sometimes you'll say, gee, if I tell the patient, give it to them really straight, I'll disappoint them and they won't, they won't be happy with me. You can't make everybody happy in a professional capacity. Your responsibility is to give them the facts and their chances in your best professional judgment. And that's not always good news. Get over it. Because if you don't do that, you're setting yourself up for trouble. And the other thing was, gee, I was afraid there'd be a big confrontation. Trust me, because I've been there. If you avoid the confrontation early on, it's still going to show up sooner or later with interest. With interest. Okay, immediate overdenture. We've got this individual. We've got the teeth. You've seen this case before. We chose to do basically root canals on more than a few teeth here. You can see we cut in a mechanical post dam. We've got the teeth set up. We go ahead and... In here, more teeth were saved. They were endodontically treated, cut off at the gum line, and the denture went in. So in this case, this one was saved as well. So we had four teeth saved on the bottom. And this patient, as it turned out over time, didn't do any better job of taking care of the teeth after the denture than before the denture. So all of these teeth were lost to caries within two years. Every one of them. Transitional over dentures. There were some talks about how do you convert a partial denture, or a temporary partial denture, to a full denture. Here, a couple of teeth were saved. This looks all gnarly as the Dickens. When they took out the rest of the teeth, they did some crown lengthening on this and sutured it up. But basically, take the impression, pour the plastic into the denture teeth, and keep going. This is a case that broke my heart because this is a lady that I had followed for over 15 years. This is a retired telephone operator, very nice lady, was a brittle diabetic. She took fastidious care of her teeth and her dentures. And so these were two endodontically treated teeth. And then we did lower anterior crown bridge, did a lower partial denture and upper denture. And she wore this case. When I took this picture, she'd been wearing this case for over 15 years. And her teeth, so people will say, well, gee, won't retain teeth for over dentures just get recurrent decay on them because the, the denture covers them up and they're prone to have plaque sit against their teeth. Isn't that going to be a real problem? So this lady's had this for... 15 or more years and the teeth look fine and the, the amalgams would wear down and get replaced every several years and I remade her denture once. My heartbreak about that was as she got older, she went into the home and once she got into the home, her eyesight really started to go bad because of the diabetes and she got really tough with her ability to, to work her hands because she had arthritis coming in. So over one six-month recall period, it went from this, and I'm sorry I didn't take a picture of it, but the next time she came in, all of her tissue up here just had that thin film of plaque all over it. The teeth were covered with plaque, and it was just turning into leathery dentin, and she had maintained this thing beautifully for, like I say, over 15 years. And once her health really started to deteriorate badly toward the end, everything started to go downhill, which is why in your practicing life, when I look at some of these situations with my patients when they're more with it, what I'm doing nowadays is getting all the teeth out and putting in implants because the implants at least can't get tooth decay. Can't get tooth decay. And so these are just close-ups. And again, this denture, these had been 
bearing over dentures for 15 or more years. This denture at the time this was taken was on one of her normal recalls. This was a denture I made her, and at the time of these pictures, this denture was about eight years old. So if your patients are good with their home care, everything doesn't look crummy right away. So it depends a lot on how things go. Patient with heavy occlusal function. Got an overdenture, and so we had natural lower teeth in the front, saved the upper cuspids. When the patient would take his denture out at night, he would basically brux his teeth with his lower natural teeth against the upper gold copings that were placed on his teeth and wear holes in them over time. So those got redone. This is what you'd call a remote overdenture, significantly after whatever teeth had been taken out. Now with this, the patient really wanted to save as many teeth as she could because her consideration was if she ever got in a better place economically, she'd like to have fixed done at a later date. So part of these teeth are endodontically treated and some of them are not. They were cut down as much as they could be and thin gold thimbles were placed on the teeth and then the denture just built over the top of this. So in these cases, in no case was the gold thimble left really tall. What's below this in the lower arch is natural teeth and fixed. So there's the lower arch where we had a single PFM crown in front. We splinted bicuspid teeth together and cantilevered a third bicuspid off each of these splinted bicuspids. So we had sort of mesial half of first molar to mesial half of first molar, which came from a cantilevered ponic with a single PFM crown in the anterior part of the mouth. You can see what was one of my considerations on her inner arch space can be a real pain in the butt. So sometimes if you're trying to save teeth to help preserve bone, etc., etc., inner arch space can be an issue. Sometimes if you're planning on attachments to use with cases, one of the things you've got to look at is what's my inner arch space from the contact vertical dimension I want to have. So basically, the teeth had to be basically ridge lamped right over these things. So here's some of our lower crown and bridge work in place, and there's our upper denture. Now, again, with this patient, talking about patient compliance, she loved it. She came back for two post-insertion adjustments, and I never saw her again. It worked well enough that she just blew me off. So whatever became of this, I don't know. I guess you could say it's a success from my point of view, but I just worry sometimes over the longer haul whether those teeth with the copings on them survived okay. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.